Hi, I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, we have a, a really cool show today, you know, pollinators and different plants and prescribed fire. It's kind of like there's a whole spectrum of things. It really is, you know, and, and over the last few years, um, probably actually a little more than that, Renee, there's been a lot of interest in pollinators and trying to help our pollinators. I know people have heard a lot about what's going on with bees and some of the challenges they're struggling with, and they're certainly an important pollinator, but there's many other pollinators out there as well. So um, we're really excited to have these topics on today. And um, we've got Renee um, Frith with um, Bernheim Arboretum. She's going to be talking about kind of designing pollinator um, habitat, if you will. So we'll look forward to having Renee on here. It'll be a, a Renee's first time on the show. So uh, another Renee, that is. So yeah. squared. <laughs> and then we've got our Megan Bulin, who is a part of our team as well. She's a PhD student here in our program, and she works in Dr. Crocker's Force Health Lab. And she's going to be talking about some happy neighbor pollinators. So um, we'll kind of figure out what she's got going on there in a little bit. And then we have from the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, another new guest, Cody Roden. And he's going to be talking about prescribed fires. So um, we're really excited to have our guests with us today, um, presenting some good knowledge, and we thank you all for being with us. If you're on Zoom, you can use the chat function to interact with us. If you're on Facebook Live, please use the comment section and we can interact with you there. But excited about today's show, Renee. Definitely, definitely. So let's go ahead and get started. So Renee, if you want to go ahead and turn your camera on. Hello, welcome. Everybody. Welcome, welcome to From the Woods today. How are you? Doing great. How's everybody doing? Wonderful, wonderful. You know, I really like your name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah, you don't hear people with the name Renee very often. It's usually uh -huh. in the middle. So it's it's really it's really fun to find someone with the same name. <laughs> we have two Renees at Bernheim, so it really? keeps it interesting. Uh, yeah. 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 But now, Renee, that's not why we asked you on the show. No, it's not at all. So tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about today. All right. So uh, design of any space can be overwhelming. And so uh, pollinator space, uh, no different. There's a lot of science behind it. And sometimes you can get bogged down in that. And so I want to let everybody know that it, it's easy. Everybody can do this. Um, and, and I want to just kind of talk through the best management practices of thinking about pollinator design. Okay. Awesome. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. We'll okay. Let me show you a presentation. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Renee Frith. I'm the Director of Horticulture and Sustainable Landscapes here at uh, Burnham Arboretum and Research Forest. We're located in Claremont, Kentucky. If you haven't been, come on out, uh, you're in for a treat. So uh, we've been just creating pollinator habitat here. We've been doing it for 93 years and uh, not, not slowing down anytime soon. So today I just wanna talk to everybody about um, you know, some best management design principles. And so we are visual species, humans that is, and we design and um, gravitate toward things in a aesthetic aspect. And so a lot of times we'll go plant shopping and we get plants that appeal to us and then put them out and then just hope for the best. But there's there's more to it. And so, um, you know, because we've kind of designed aesthetically over the course of our um, human existence, we've come into some problems and we need to recognize these problems and, and there's ways out of them, all right? So uh, by building up, we've actually decreased pollinator and, and, uh, and uh, wildlife habitat. And how we've done this is think about um, you know, species need corridors. Uh, think about how we move around the United States. We use interstates, highways, uh, and it's in a in a way to get us there efficiently, right? So uh, with pollinators, they need corridors and avenues so that they can sustain their own life. They need to reproduce. They need to eat, um, you know, just like us. And so as we build up, uh, the land around us, we are decreasing those corridors. And then also uh, in the same vein, we're reducing native plant diversity uh, through lack of plant species and the insects that they support. So um, don't take my word for it. Uh, the, an article came out in um, uh, Northern Kentucky Tribune and it, it underscores the fact that uh, the human species is growing at a rapid rate, especially here in Kentucky. Uh, housing, multifamily housing is up almost 100%. Um, and that's greater than the average of 26% uh, increase from the United States as a whole. Uh, not housing, uh, 
is one point, but warehouses are another. And so uh, just, you know, Bernheim's that dark blob right there in the center, and uh, we're surrounded by growth. Louisville to the north, um, Bardstown, Mount Washington to the east, uh, Fort Knox to the west, and then we have warehouses going up all around us. Um, so this is uh, a lot of land that's being um, modified at a rapid rate. And so, you know, what do, what do we do about that? Are we actually taking into account ways to offset natural land loss? And I don't think we're doing as good a job as we should. We're not putting that as a top priority. We're putting the growth as a top priority. And so when, when you get a new building, what do you normally see? Uh, they throw down some turf grass, they, they put irrigation on it and hope for the best. But who is this really supporting? Uh, it's not supporting native pollinators, that's for sure. And so what can one person do? I hear this a lot uh, when I give talks out here at Bernheim. It's like, I'm just one person, what can I do? Well, you can actually do a lot. Um, we're, we are all very smart individuals in our own right. And we have the ability to think and communicate with others and, and grow our knowledge in any area that we choose. And so I always say like, if we're going to you know, plant four pollinators, we need to have a plan for sustainability first. So it's plan and then we plant for sustainability. And sustainability is this, uh, it's a big word and it, it has lots of buzz around it, but really it's providing resources so that humans don't have to continually touch nature and nature can support itself. So that's my, the easiest way that I can describe what sustainability means to me. And I start with where does the water flow? Um, you know, you can, and you think about it this way, what, what's most important in life? Um, well, uh, some people say money and some people say water, but if I want to go find the problems in, you know, government and big business, I follow the money. But if I want to find life in nature, I follow the water. Water is the sustainer of every life force on this planet. And so I consider a couple of things up front when I'm trying to figure out how, how am I going to care for my plants? in terms of water. And so I look at my space and I say, where are my impervious surfaces? Where, where is that asphalt? Where is that concrete? Um, how does that water flow through my space? And where does it collect? Um, and then if, could I capture some of that water runoff into my garden? So do I need to regrade the soil in a way that almost makes it like a rain garden? so I can capture and use water that's already existing. And I also wanna plan, I wanna, I wanna consciously think about timing and say, I'm gonna plant in fall. And why do I wanna plant in fall? That's when I'm getting the most consistent rainfall. Uh, Mother Nature's a great provider. And so I wanna take advantage of that because after all, um, when you put on healthy roots, you get healthy shoots. And so the best time to do that is during a dormancy period uh, of fall and winter to, to put on those roots to get those good shoots. And then I think through lastly, what if I do end up in a drought scenario after plant establishment? Do I have a source of supplemental water? Do I have a spigot nearby? Um, if not, do I have a water tank? And if I don't, then I may need to start to think about more drought tolerant plant choices. And so for example, this was an aerial picture that was taken in winter last year. This is our visitor center out at Bernheim and you can see that parking lot island. So all of, all of my perennials and shrubs are, are, and trees are dormant for the winter, of course. And, uh, but look at all of that asphalt and sidewalk around this space. So we regraded so that we could capture that water runoff uh, and make this a more sustainable landscape. And so who are we hosting? You know, any good party, you can, you can have a guest list and you can say, I wanna bring these people to this party. And then they're always gonna bring some friends. And so then it, you know, sometimes can kind of get out of hand. So, um, but always up front, you want to make a good guest list. And so what I mean by that, um, and this is a, a project that I'm currently working on with the team in our edible garden. Um, so we, you know, we want to control some, some bad actors. So we have this control column over here, and we've noticed we have aphid pressure, spider mite pressure, 
uh, sawflies and the like. And so we want to try to control those with beneficial insects. And um, because after all, we don't use insecticides uh, at Bernheim at all, period. So um, then I say, hey, what insects control these? And so I come up with a list of insects that do. And that's who I want to invite to this planting party. And so uh, how do I do that? Well, um, I, I made a little chart. So I gave them, I assigned all my beneficial insects a, a letter, um, A through K and um, oh, P actually. And so then I said, hey, um, what are the plants that support those insects? Like who, who hosts these insects plant-wise? And keep in mind, um, yes, plants are pretty aesthetically to people, but they, they're here to serve a purpose uh, for food for pollinators. So um, if we're keeping that in mind, we're using plants to feed the beneficial insects. And so then I just kind of make a column and I say, hey, I want all these plants. And, but I want to know what family they're in. And why is that important? Because I want diversity uh, of species um, from a family perspective. Because if we usually get all one thing in the Asteraceae family, um, what if there are uh, diseases and insects specific to Asteraceae? Well, they could affect my whole bed, which is no good um, for any of us. All right, here comes the math. All right, so we, we have to have math. It's all right, math's not hard. Um, so we, we have to know how much we need, right? How, how many plants? So I use, I, I love free. Um, anybody that knows me knows that I'm gonna find the most cost-effective way to do anything. And so I use Google Earth and it, it can give me the square footage of the area uh, that, I'm, that I'm looking at. And then I do easy math, okay? I, I plant all my perennials 12 inches on center, and I do this for a combination of, of reasons. Um, so one, it's easy math. So if I have a thousand square feet, I need a thousand plants, one foot on center. And then um, the other thing is, yes, I'm going to plant over plant, but I know I'm going to have some plant loss because especially out here, we have high deer pressure. Um, and then sometimes there's just some crop failure. So if I over plant a little bit, um, my bed's still going to look full in spring. Um, shrubs and trees, I, I plant for maturity. I space them for maturity. And then I just keep a running total. So if I needed a thousand plants, if I say, oh, well, I want 20 um, butterfly milkweed. Okay, cool. Now I have, um, you know, 980 plants left in my, in my planting bank. And so then I just subtract until I have zero plants. I place my order, I pay my invoice, and then my math is done. And I can go back to all the fun stuff that we were doing. And so this is just an example of Google Earth. And so the blue ruler to the right, I select that on Google Earth. I measure out the bed and then magically it gives me my square footage. Uh, so it's, it is pretty easy and, and quite fun to do math sometimes. Can we just draw? All right, because that's usually how we start. Uh, but notice that this is like the fourth step in line. So I'm kind of flipping this whole design process on its end. And I'm thinking first and I'm drawing last. And so I use PowerPoint. Once again, I've, I've, I've got it. It's free resource. Why not use it? It communicates well. It looks clean. And so I dedicate beds and I say, hey, this is where I want the beds and this is what I want them to be. I name them. And then I start you know, putting in colorful blobs. And I try to match the, the color to the color, bloom color of the plant. And so that kind of helps me make sure that I have the, the aesthetics that I want uh, from a design process. And then I assign them letters. And so these letters correspond with a, a symbol chart. And so then, you know, you can make it as complex or as simple as you want in the design process. And it's kind of fun. And then everybody has a map and we can lay the plants out in fall when it's time. And this is really what you guys are, are here for. We want to look at the pretty plants. And so notice this is the last step. So if we did everything right, we're going to plant these plants. And while we ideally wanted to bring specific species to the party, everybody, all the beneficial insects are welcome and, and they'll show up. And so I went across a couple of landscapes that we've done over the past year and a half here at Bernheim. And I spent less than 30 minutes just taking photos. 
Um, and so as you can see, I mean, we've got, there were, there were probably five or six bee species, and mind you, this is 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, five or six bee species, lots of moths, butterflies, so eastern tiger swallowtail on swamp milkweed. Um, there is uh, the banded hair streak on the butterfly milkweed, that beautiful orange uh, plant up top. And I even found the dogbane beetle, native beetle, uh, host species is dogbane. Uh, but I removed the dogbane from this bed to plant and, and it came looking for it, but it found um, the pycnanthum muticum or mountain mint instead. It, it, it didn't really like it. So I, I think I upset the dogbane beetle. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've got some, some other gorgeous, like the, the silver spotted skipper on this common milkweed. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say, I, I don't know how to get into plants uh, for pollinators. Well, just do it like this. Who do you want to bring? What problems do you want to solve in your landscape? And if you, if you can't find, you know, any plants that you just really gravitate toward once you do that, Start with mountain mint. That's this plant in the bottom right corner, Pycnanthum muticum. It brings so many pollinators to the party. It's ridiculous. Uh, and so then that'll get you some buzz and some inspiration going um, in, your, in your own yard. So I'm, out, I'm at Bernheim all the time. Um, I feel like I live here and that's okay because it's a gorgeous place. So if you wanna come out and learn more, uh, feel free, hit me up. The website's here, www.bernheim.org, and uh, my email's here on the screen, renee.frith at bernheim.org. Thank you guys so much. Hey, thank you so much for that presentation. I loved it. Um, you know, there's a lot of things I was like, ooh, I want that. And I want that. I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. But we did have a question on what was the best way to buy seed? You know, I noticed sometimes, you know, you'll get seed that it won't have exactly what you want in it. So who do you trust basically is what I, because I've known I've run into that problem. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really hard because there's that retail angle and there's that wholesale angle. And so we use roundstone seed primarily for um, all of our seed needs and they can do custom blends. You can, you know, they have Monarch mixes already. They have all sorts of pollinator mixes, but sometimes I go to them and I say, I only need these specific species and that's what I want. And they can do a custom blend and Roundstone Seeds local. They're just a little further down the road. Yeah, they do great work. You know, and I would say if we have woodland owners out there, Renee, and maybe larger properties and stuff, I know that our fish and wildlife biologists can work with them um, and put mm -hmm. pollinator habitat. Sometimes they'll have seed and equipment and drills and other things that they can use as well. So if you're a landowner and you have some property, talk to your natural resource professional about how you might put in these larger, you know, pollinator habitats. And there's also some um, uh, NRCS money available to help mm -hmm. um, with the installation of these practices because we all recognize the importance of having these pollinators. So, uh, Renee, uh, thank you for putting that good presentation together and hopefully it, it inspired people to kind of create pollinator habitat everywhere. Love it. That's that's the hope. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yep. We'll have you back, Renee. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. So speaking of more pollinators. Yeah, let's just keep that pollinator train rolling. Exactly, right? exactly. Um, we have Megan Bulin on here to talk about what you should be doing for your yard in the fall um, and anything you can do to help with pollinators. Hey, Renee, thanks for having me on today again. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, you're good. Okay, great. Uh, I've been having some technical issues today, as Renee can attest to. So just <laughs> want to make sure that everything is running the way it should. You're good. Uh, you know, I, I'm so glad that we just had that awesome presentation talking a little bit about uh, what you can do to make pollinators happy and healthy during the growing season. But what happens to all of those wonderful pollinators during the fall and winter uh, and the dormant season of the year? You know, summer is coming to an end and a lot of those pollinators, uh, they don't go away in the winter. They're still with us year round. So what can you do in your yard, not only when everything is blooming in the spring and summer, but during that dormancy period to help keep all of those wonderful native pollinators happy and healthy? So today we are going to be talking about that uh, very thing. Great. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about prepping your yard for fall uh, pollinators. 
So, you know, I, a lot of the time, I think that we think about pollinators with everything blooming during the growing season. But as I was saying, a lot of those pollinators, the butterflies, the bees, uh, a lot of the native flies that serve as pollinators, they're with us year round, even though we might not see them during the fall and winter of the year. You know, so what can you do to make your yard a happy place and a nice habitat for those pollinators during that dormancy period? Uh, you know, as Renee was talking about, a lot of our area, natural areas now are very fragmented by land use, by urbanization, and your yard can be a very important vital habitat for a lot of these pollinator species that may be losing their natural habitat in other places. And in the fall of the year, a lot of us start thinking about cleaning up our, those yards. We think about raking up the leaves, uh, cutting everything back, and trying to make that yard look nice and neat and tidy for the fall. And that's the way that most people uh, handle their yards and fall cleanup uh, definitely in our region and throughout most of, of, of the U.S. Uh, but that might not be the best thing to do for a lot of those pollinators to keep them happy and healthy as we move into the fall of the year. You know, raking up leaves, cutting everything back, uh, you might be making your yard look neat and tidy, but you're actually removing a lot of vital habitat for those bees and butterflies and other native pollinators. So today we're going to be talking about a few of the things that you can do to take this, you know, your wonderful native garden or wonderful uh, yard and make it a nice, happy habitat for all of these wonderful pollinators and insects uh, in the fall and winter of the year. Even though we can't see them, they're still there, they're still hanging out with us, and we want to take these habitats and make them into a place where these animals can thrive. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the native plants that we have, the stems and the seed heads, even though we might normally cut those back, they're vital uh, food for, for birds that might not migrate during the winter. A lot of our native birds stay here and they can feed on these seed heads and the seeds in them as, a, as an important source of food in the winter when a lot of other food sources might not be available. You can also find a lot of native bees overwintering in the stems of perennial grasses and shrubs. Uh, a lot of our solitary bees, you know, normally when we think of bees, we think of honeybees, but a lot of native bumblebees, mason bees, and carpenter bees are solitary. And during the winter, they'll go live in the hollowed out stems of these grasses and shrubs as a safe, warm space to ride out the winter months. And our native butterflies as well also rely upon a lot of these perennial plants uh, for shelter during the winter, which we'll talk about more in, in just a minute. So, you know, it's like, okay, this is all good, but what can I do? What are the things that you want to be doing in your yard to make it a nice, safe place for pollinators? And the first and most important thing you want to do is you want to leave the leaves alone. I know that we all think about raking up big piles of fall leaves and, uh, and bagging those up in plastic trash bags or maybe those brown waste removal bags and setting them out to the curb. But when you do that, you're, you're doing a few things that might not be ideal for your pollinators and for the health of your yard and its, its diversity as well. Uh, when you leave those leaves in your yard, you're creating a, a dense layer of future mulch uh, and keeping those nutrients from the trees and plants in your yard in place. When you remove the leaves and you take them away in the fall, you're removing a lot of the nutrients that would otherwise be recycled and returned back into your yard and into those flower beds and the plants growing in your yard. Uh, but additionally, you're also removing vital habitat for a lot of butterflies and moths over the winter. Uh, you know, a lot of our native butterflies and moths, they form chrysalises or cocoons, and they ride out the winter, uh, often down in that leaf layer and in that mulch layer. The luna moth that so many of us know and love, it rides out the winter here in its cocoon form. And they take that cocoon, the luna moths, and wrap it in a layer of leaves and disguise their cocoons in the leaf litter on the forest floor or on the leaf litter in your yard to uh, go through the winter months that way. So when you rake up all those leaves and bag them up to take them away in the fall, you might be removing a lot of overwintering uh, butterflies and moths that are living down in that leaf litter. And even if that's not the case, you might be removing a very important source of nutrients in your yard for future use. 
Uh, you also want to avoid over mulching these guard uh, over mulching these garden materials. You know, you might think about taking this material and mulching it up, chopping it up. But even then, you could be removing um, habitat for these insects, and you might be chopping up some of these insects that are sleeping and dormant in that material in those uh, perennial grass stems in the leftover flower materials and in the leaves that are accumulating in your yard. Uh, you also want to avoid cutting back your herbaceous and woody perennials too low. Uh, most, most, recommend, most sources recommend leaving 15 to 18 inches of height in the fall if you do want to cut your plants back. Uh, because we have a large number of native solitary bees, mostly mason bees and carpenter bees, that actually spend the winter living in the hollowed out stems of these grasses. So your milkweeds, a lot of uh, echinaceas and other native plants that you'll actually find these insects living inside those stems all winter long as a safe place to ride out the cold, dormant winter months. And they might do this as an adult, but very often you'll actually find that these bees will create chambers in these stems and lay eggs in there that will develop over the, sort, over the course of a winter. And you'll have the larvae and the pupa of these insects living in these stems, waiting for the warm weather so that they can reemerge and, uh, and carry out pollinating all of your flowers next year. You also want to leave seed heads um, on plants and other flowers, perennial plants and other flowers. You know, a lot of our native birds stay here over the winter. They'll utilize these seed heads. A lot of small mammals are going to enjoy the seeds in these flowers uh, over the course of the winter. So for the sake of all of the wonderful uh, uh, wildlife that might come visit your yard, the, it's really important to try to leave those seed heads if you feel like you can. And this is a great activity, you know, for, for people uh, all winter long to be able to observe the birds and observe the other animals that are coming to your yard to feed on these seed heads. Uh, you also want to wait to clean up your garden in the spring until your nighttime temperatures are above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the general recommendation. Um, because you know, if you think about what's happening next spring and as we warm up a little bit, the days might be nice and sunny, but at night those temperatures still drop. And a lot of these native insects uh, during those nighttime temperatures, they still need a warm sheltered place to retreat to, to stay so relatively warm overnight until they can warm up again the next spring, the next morning and keep on going. So leaving a lot of that uh, yard waste, those old stems, the branches and grasses, and even some of those leaves it, uh, through into the early spring will be really helpful in giving those uh, bees and pollinators and other animals a place to stay during the cool spring nights before it really starts to warm up and get going the following year. And uh, you know, there's other little animals that also call these leaves home. Even if everyone doesn't like snakes, uh, a lot of our snakes in the early springtime, they're very important for pest control and rodent control. And they'll utilize these fallen leaves as well. Like this little garter snake that I found on a hike this past spring. You know, he was huddled up in the early morning underneath these leaves, trying to stay sheltered uh, until it really got warmed up so he could get out in the sun and get moving. And you know, I would encourage you to, to not throw away those yard waste there. Even if you want to clean up a little bit in the fall, if you want to rake your leaves back a little bit to within the confines of your, uh, your flower garden beds and get them off of your lawn. You know, I know that there's a certain aesthetic that people want to keep, but I would really encourage you, leave your leaves, don't throw away all those yard waste, the stems, the flower heads, because they are an important source of food and a vital uh, overwintering habitat to all of the pollinators that call your yard home uh, during the spring and summer when everything is flowering and blooming. Uh, during the winter, these materials give them a safe space to overwinter as eggs, larvae, pupae or even adults so that the following spring they can re-emerge and they can continue to help your yard and your community grow and thrive with happy healthy pollinators. And these are just a few resources uh, that you might find useful if this is a topic that has intrigued you or you would like to learn a little bit more and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, as, as best as I can. Well, thank you, Megan. We greatly appreciate that. And, you know, every year it's usually it'll get 
like it'll be you know how Kentucky is it's it's 91 day and it's 20 the next and I actually I'll miss pulling up my garden stuff and I'm like oh I didn't get to that but now I don't feel as bad (laughs) you're leaving it there you're providing an important habitat for all of those insects you know I know that we have this idea that a yard needs to look really manicured and we need to have all of that cut down raked up and thrown away in the fall but leaving that is actually so important for the biodiversity of these natural communities and even for the health of your soils it's important to leave that material if you feel like you can okay we gotta change mindsets megan yeah a little bit just change them just a little bit Um, (laughs) do have some questions megan in the chat pod um somebody has planted some grass lines for pollinators um now they want to plant uh, more plants and they want to kill the grass only um when should they try to get rid of that do you know megan or um to remove the grass for pollinators yeah or? Uh, okay. so should I stay away from the summer and the fall or when would oh when that? when to spray when does when spraying does matter mm-hmm. okay um that you might want to check with that particular uh insecticide it's not one that I'm particularly familiar with uh but a lot of those insecticides I would definitely wait until everything stops flying because when everything is flying and all those pollinators are moving, that's when they stand the best chance of coming into contact with whatever, whatever pesticides you might be using. But you also might want to check the label and see what it says about different arthropods and insects uh, and what the risk factors associated uh, with that herbicide are in the first place, because it could be that it might be a relatively narrow spectrum. If there's anyone else on here today who's more familiar with this particular uh, herbicide, I'd you'd love to learn a little more. Yeah. I'm not, Maggie, but I did want to echo what you said. Um, following that label is critical. Um, yeah. Not only is it very informative, it's the law, right? Yes, it says where absolutely. you can apply stuff and when you can apply it and what you can mix it with and all that. So make sure you're very familiar with that label before you apply it. For sure. Yeah, I always read the label. Okay. And then they said they've pulled some dried plant heads to reseed. Should they not do that? You know, I think that cut, pulling those seed heads, there's there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to leave some for wildlife, that's great. But also in the case of trying to reseed for the following year, you know, you're, you're trying to conserve those native plants. You're trying to bring them back the following year and taking a few seed heads uh, to, to collect seed for the following year. I think it's a great idea. I do that at home myself, uh, you know, as things are starting to mature for the season, I'm already thinking about going out and collecting seed heads to drive for seed sources courses in the spring uh, also. So no no harm in that from my perspective at all. All right. And should they mow only in the spring? Mowing, mowing is a tricky one, you know, because it's such an aesthetic choice for a lot of people. You know, you live in areas where maybe even if it isn't your first concern in the spring, everyone else, uh, your neighbors are all mowing. You know, I think that from a perspective of mowing, waiting until the grass has really started to grow in the spring is a good indicator of when to mow. A lot of people will get out and try to, to mow before the grass has even really started to get going again. Uh, no point in doing that. And if you wait as long as you feel like you can in the spring, you're giving as many of those pollinators as possible a chance to really uh, reemerge and get going. But with the mowing, you're thinking about grass and not so much about the leaves. So if you can keep leaves raked up in piles, uh, maybe within perennial beds, then you're not going to be mowing and mulching over those and possibly not chopping up poor little chrysalises and cocoons in the (laughs) leaf litter. Yeah. And I noticed within that question, there was a reference to NRCS. So if this is under a contract with NRCS, there should be some specifications of when you can mow and frequency of mowing. Um, So work with your natural resource professional, whether that's a wildlife biologist or a forester, whoever made that prescription, they should help you with that. But it should be clearly um, laid out as far as the requirements. Cody, you have something to add? (laughs) Yeah, no, those are really good points. And I might just add, you know, Mm -hmm. something we talk about as far as ground nesting birds and other species of wildlife and insects as well you know the rule of thumb is mow in March and consider why you're mowing you know if it's uh, mowing for aesthetics in your yard or if you have an open land situation like an old pasture ground or something like that that you're wanting to manage for wildlife mowing in March really the only time you want to mow is to reduce those woody stems in that open land um, aspect as well as the spraying with the herbicide and so just being thoughtful of of why you're doing that and, and mowing in March 
helps kind of shoot the gap. You may get some insects that are still living in those stems, and you might also disrupt some some ground nesting birds or, or some wildlife. But in March, not a lot of wildlife or birds are nesting at that point in time, and a lot of the insects have kind of um, done their thing. And so that's what we usually recommend, but, but the points that Billy and Megan made um, are just as important as well. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, Megan. We greatly appreciate as it. As always. Yeah. As so you can do way more than mushrooms, obviously. Yes, Megan. obviously. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that, you know, that's dangerous, Megan, showing us kind of all your, um, your, your skill set. Exactly. Well, I was really happy that this was a uh, topic that people were already covering this week because it is an important topic. It it's a perfect time of the year. So uh, I'm glad that we were able to talk about this today. Yeah. Well, right. thanks for helping thank us you. and our viewers out. Thank you all. Yeah. All right. Well, Cody's uh, already on, so that's great. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, ahead. Cody, your first time on From the Woods today, man. Thank uh, you welcome. so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of these conversations, and I'm learning a little bit myself, so this is yeah. awesome. Yeah, they're fun. You can tune in every week, and yeah, <laughs> we're <exactly>. here. So. <laughs> No, I'm some Cody's with Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, and we've got Hilm on today. He's going to be talking about prescribed fire. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit, Cody, about prescribed fire. I know some people think, oh, fire. No, that's not good. Yeah, yeah. And so that um, I'm glad you brought that up, Renee. And so that thought process is actually pretty new as far as, you know, the anthropogenic timeline. Right. And so fire has been something that we have been controlling and using in some aspects since before we're even homo sapiens. So if we think about like campfires and stuff like that, species that predated homo sapien were using fire for things like cooking meat, um, some using charcoal for art and things like that. Think of these caves in like South Africa and stuff like that. And so controlling fire on the landscape is something that we've been doing for a really long time. And it's really only the last like hundred years or so. Think of Smokey the Bear that we've stopped using fire. And then we think more of like, oh no, fire, right? And, and there's many aspects that, that fire is bad and, and can, you know, think of structural fires, that's bad. Um, the wildfires we see a lot in the media, that's bad. But there's so much more to fire that we can utilize um, as for stewardship um, ways, you know, moving forward. And, and it's really a tool that we use a bunch in the past and we've very recently stopped using. Okay. Well, uh, Cody, you know, I get a chance to work with woodland owners across the state and prescribed fire is always something that kind of comes up and they're wanting to know mm -hmm. if it's right for them. So just, yeah, thank you so much for being on with us today and sharing this information. Yeah, no problem. And so, you know, definitely part of the emphasis um, for this talk is going to be, you know, trying to, to debunk and demystify some of the, the issues or intimidation with fire. Um, but I will say the best way to do that um, is to go out and, and try it yourself. And so, you know, I'll have some contact information because 10 minutes, unfortunately, is not long enough to, to maybe make you super comfortable with, um, you know, applying fire to your forest. But, uh, but please contact me or any of the other individuals we have um, at the very end of the presentation, and, and we will definitely help you. We're very excited about fire at Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, and I also mentioned the Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council, which is a group of people that are they're very interested in, in putting fire back on the landscape in Kentucky. All right, and so just a quick outline, like I mentioned before, you know, a lot of the barriers associated with um, private landowners using fire on their property is, you know, first of all, why? Why am I using fire? Why is this important? Um, and then secondly, is how, you know, how, how do I do this safely? How do I make sure this doesn't look like um, a CNN news report of, of the far west in California or North Texas where there is wildfire issues? And so, when we do talk about prescribed fire, we're talking about fire set on purpose in a controlled capacity. And when we're talking about prescribed fire in our forests, you know, we're talking about this stuff over here on the right, this very low intensity, slow creeping fire that just burns up the leaf litter, right? And so, you know, oftentimes I think, you know, we're, we think about fire in the forest, we think about trees on fire and things like that. That's really not what we're talking about in prescribed fire for sure. And that's really not um, the amount of fire. And I'll talk a lot about historic fire regimes and stuff like that in this talk. Those historic fire regimes were what we're looking at here on the right. It was very low intensity, um, ground level burning in the forest. And then in our open lands and our, our native uh, warm season grass and, and pollinator plantings and things like that, it was it was higher about the height or three times the height of the vegetation, but still very much um, not out of control. Okay, so first of all, we're going to talk about why. So, 
you know, we're, I love this pollinator talk and talking about the health um, of not only our, our open wild systems, but also the health of our backyard systems, right? And so when we talk about that, and this has been really set up, you know, we're talking about, you know, things that increase diversity. So that last bullet point there. And so we also, when we're thinking about our healthy forests, you know, healthy forests actually require disturbance. So disturbance increases diversity, right? And so a good way to think about this is if you've ever seen a cornfield, you know, you're looking out there, that doesn't really look healthy, does it? I mean, that's a monoculture, that's a single plant. They're definitely necessary to, to feed the world, right? But it doesn't necessarily look healthy from an ecosystem standpoint. And our forests are the same way. So they need a lot of, they need disturbance to be diverse. So if we kind of let our forest go, they might all um, climax into a community that is one or two trees with nothing at the ground level, no herbaceous material, no shrubs. And that's really not what we want when we're thinking about the health of our system. And so fire does, fire attributes that or any disturbance really, really makes this stuff happen. It, it activates the seed bank. You know, maybe there's some native pollinating resources in your forest that were there hundreds of years ago. They're laying dormant. Um, disturbance, whether it's cutting trees, um, burning or anything like that, stimulates that seed bank. And so essentially what we're talking about here is going from this top picture where you can see the forest is real closed in. There's a lot of shade, not much sunlight reaching the ground. And then we pop in some disturbance, this middle picture here with the little um, low intensity fire, prescribed fire. And then boom, here's what we get here at the bottom, right? And so this, I will say this had a little bit more than prescribed fire done to it, but in this bottom picture here, and we'll get more into this as well, you know, we have a lot more herbaceous ground cover, a lot more areas for bugs and pollinating um, insects to root around in, as well as things like turkeys and quail and squirrels and rabbits, you know, you name it. You know, this bottom picture is a much, much more diverse and healthy system than this top one. And just another quick example of that. So here on the left, we have a forest, an eastern forest. This is in Kentucky. Um, and as you can see, uh, we have no fire or no management. And on the right, we do have fire and management. And so there's some nuanced differences between these two pictures, right? And so if we look on the ground um, of the no fire of this left-hand picture, you know, we don't see, we see some um, herbaceous material and stuff, but it looks real shady, right? We have some rays of sunlight touching the forest floor. But we look on the right here, you know, we have a lot more sun hitting the ground, a lot more herbaceous material in the bottom. You can see gaps in the canopy up here, right? And so this is what our forest could look like with a little bit of management and some prescribed fire. And so I pose the question, you know, which of these two looks more healthy as a healthy system, right? Is it this dark shady one on the left here, or is it this nice sunny, um, you can see there's more plants, more different plants in this picture on the right, right? And in my mind, um, and, in, and in, from an ecosystem standpoint, this one on the right here is definitely healthier. All right, so we need disturbance to keep our forest healthy, right? And so how do we achieve this disturbance? And so as I mentioned um, earlier in the talk, you know, fire is the oldest tool in the, in the human toolbox, the anthropogenic toolbox, right? And so actually humans have been burning a lot in Kentucky uh, for 3,000 years, up till about 300 years ago is when we really stopped burning. And by humans, I mean Native people. So Native Americans burnt a lot in the state of Kentucky and in the East. And so over 3,000 years, that's a really long time, right? Our forests have adapted to exist kind of in this disturbed state through time. And so they burned so much and they utilized uh, prescribed fire, again, these low controlled burns through the forest so much that they actually kind of opened our forest up through time. And so this, again, increased diversity, increased the amount of herbaceous um, plants on the forest floor, as well as the trees um, in these systems, the overhead canopy trees kind of shifted more to, to quality hardwoods and quality mast produce or quality nut producing trees like hickories and oaks and, and beech trees and stuff like that. And so, you know, this truly was a healthy system, these more open forests. And as you can see in this map, you know, the whole eastern United States was more what could be considered open woods. So think of like savannas, um, things with trees spaced out more, not a lot of shade. So a lot of sunlight filtering down and hitting the forest floor, as opposed to, you know, up in the, up in the far northern United States up here in Pennsylvania and Maine and stuff like that. That's really where you had your closed canopy, um, darker forests. And so the next question is, so why, you know, we need disturbance to increase diversity, which increases the health of our overall forested system. So the next question is, how the heck do we do this, right? 
And so before, you know, we get into the meat of that, there is one thing I like to mention, and that's essentially, you know, we have to operate within the framework of Kentucky state law. And so there's two things that we need to be cognizant of when we go to apply fire in a landscape. The first one is this fire hazard season. And so this lasts from February 15th to April 30th, and then you can burn as you wish, and then kicks on again, October 1st to December 15th. And so within these time frames. You can only burn between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. And so that's essentially you can only burn in the evening time. And the second thing we need to be cognizant of from a from a law standpoint is anytime we're burning our wild lands or our back 40 or even our front 40, you know, we need to have a fire break around that area. And I'll get I'll get really into what a fire break is um, here moving forward, but I would like to touch on this picture here on the right. Um, and as Renee mentioned and, and Megan touched on as well, you know, we're fighting sprawl with some of these um, solutions um, and things like that. We can burn in sprawl. So this, this picture, if you look in the background, you can see some vehicles and stuff like that. So we practiced prescribed fire on, this was like a 0.2 acre plot um, that was surrounded by parking lots in the city of Frankfurt, right? And so we can do this stuff very surgically um, and safely. So we pulled this off, no, no vehicles got melted or anything. This was a very low intensity, slow creeping fire. And that's exactly what we wanted. Okay. So we're going to apply prescribed fire um, in our forested systems. I apologize here. The example I'm going to run with is actually in an open system. Um, I'm a small game biologist for Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. And so a lot of the stuff I do is in the open land. So think of like old fields or native plantings, um, areas with a lot of grass and forbs and, and very few trees. And so our first step, whether we're in the open lands or in the woods, is to identify our unit. What space do we want to burn? Um, and when we're doing that, we're going to try to think of where would the fire naturally stop? And so again, we're thinking about a slow intensity, slow creeping fire. Where would that naturally stop? So some things come to mind, you know, creeks, um, you know, things like that, trails, um, old forestry roads or old forester roads, logging roads, stuff like that, um, anywhere that would slow down or stop the fire. So in this case, I have two fire breaks. The one fire break is just a bush hog path in this yellow line here around the unit. And then my secondary fire break, just in case it got past my first fire break, is a, a walking trail here. And then this is kind of a wet ditch that runs along um, on this right-hand side of the image. So when we go to identify our units, we're thinking of areas that will naturally break the fire. And that'll help us out when we go to build our fire breaks, which is the second step. So this is gonna be three easy steps. First step, identify our unit. Second step, uh, build our fire breaks. So in the forest, so again, here, we're looking at a, a burn in the forest. And again, you know, we have this low intensity creeping fire within the leaf litter. Um, our fire break, a good rule of thumb is the break needs to be three times as wide as the tallest vegetation that will burn. So in this sense, the vegetation that's burning are dead leaves. And so how high stacked up are the dead leaves, right? And usually if an area hasn't been burned for a long time, it could be about six inches or so. So we'll round up and say that's a foot. And then we say one foot times three is three feet. And so you see these black lines here, I've kind of outlined where the fire break actually is. And so this is actually a little bit wider than three feet. We had some employees that were overzealous, uh, which is not a bad thing. You know, a wider break is not going to get us in trouble. But essentially, they use rakes to rake out the leaves and rake it down to dirt. And as a fire approaches this line, it goes out. It stops. We don't have to worry about it. It's contained within that unit as it's surrounded. The whole unit is surrounded by this fire break. So if we had tall grass or forbs or a pollinator planting, you know, our, our break would have to be wider, right? Because the height of those flames is going to be a lot higher as the vegetation is standing, um, say about three feet tall, three to seven feet tall. So our, our tall grass planting, our breaks are going to have to be at least 20 feet wide. And again, that could be bush hog, dis, um, anything along those lines. Just something that would slow down or break the um, progression of the fire. Okay, so our third step, remember fire in three easy steps. We identified our unit. We build our fire breaks. Now we're ready to light the thing off. So you always, always start in the downwind or upslope side or corner of your unit. And so why is that? Well, we know if, if you lit fire, um, if you lit fire in the up, upwind side, fire moves with the wind and it moves upslope more quickly than it moves down slope and against the wind. And so we're gonna to try to start the fire in a way that begins a backing flame that creeps down and consumes flammable material. And then 
when we start our head fire or come around and, and begin the ignition on the upwind side, you know, that can run into the area that's already been burnt. And so I'm going to, so in this particular unit, the slope runs um, from the right to the left here. You can see this black line is slope. And then the wind direction when we burn off this unit is always out of the east. So it's blowing from east to west. And so where are we going to start? Well, we're going to start right here at J4, if you can see that. Here's my drip torch. This is just a tool that we use to, to ignite um, flammable material. And so I'm going to try this. I think this is the first time I've ever done a an animation um, in PowerPoint. So let's see if this works. So we're gonna start at J4 and we're gonna slowly go to J6 and then we're gonna go all the way around from J1, J2, all the way back to J4. And so that's gonna be our ignition pattern. So by the time we get down here where the fire really starts running uphill, this stuff up here is gonna be burned down probably to this path. So we have like a lot more black area consumed material that's gonna slow the fire down. Okay, so there you have it, fire in three easy steps. I just want to mention um, a couple of those resources I was talking about earlier. And so the Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council is a really good resource. Um, just Google or search Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council. It's kyfire.org. And so this is a group of fire practitioners across the state, um, private landowners, um, anybody is welcome to join um, this, this organization. Uh, we have an annual meeting and, and meetings and stuff like that. We also host training. So there's two main trainings we host. Um, and the Kentucky Certified Burn Boss training is pretty involved. The one that you all might be interested in is the eight-hour landowner course. And again, this is a basic introduction to prescribed fire and control burning. And essentially, after you get this eight-hour course, um, the hope is that you'd be a lot more confident to utilize this tool um, on your private lands. And so I know I went pretty quickly through that, but, um, but yeah, here's my contact information. Please email me, call me. Here's the contact information for the um, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Fire Management Officer. And, and please, if, if, you, if this has if this is, you know, tickled anything in the back of your mind about, man, I feel like I might be wanting to burn, contact me or contact Jacob Stewart here, and, and we, will get the, we will get you going in the right direction for sure. Well, thank you, Cody. We greatly appreciate that. And it looks like we actually have someone who has put in the chat that they're scared to try that themselves, but was wondering if you all did anything like that. Um, so I didn't know if if that was something, I guess they could take that class and that would help them out. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, whoever put that in the chat, thank you for saying that you're not alone. So that's, that's the major barrier we have um, for private landowners applying fire um, on their landscapes. And so there's nothing wrong with that. Historically, we did Kentucky Fish and Wildlife would go out and do a lot of burning on private lands. We've since moved away from that and we've moved more into training people on how to do it themselves. And so, yes, please um, reach out to me, go to the Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council. There's a way you can sign up um, and, and say you're interested in what county you're in. And then we periodically put on those eight hour trainings um, and we're moving towards trying to, to make those trainings. So we actually have like live burn exercises and stuff. And it really does help you get more confident or comfortable with, with utilizing fire on your property. Okay. Um, the next question is, how much does low intensity burning hurt the timber value over time? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, thanks so much for asking that. And so essentially, and there's been a lot of research on this, I, I purposely did not put that in here. Um, but, you know, it, please reach out if you want more information aside from what I'm just about to talk about. And I know there's others on here that know a lot more about this than I do. But essentially, you the part of the tree with the low intensity burning that may get fire scarred, first of all, you know, it's going to hurt the trees we don't want in our forest more than the ones that we want our quality timber resources. Mm -hmm. So it's going to hurt the maples. It's going to hurt um, the invasive shrubs like honeysuckle and autumn olive. It's not really going to hurt our, our oak trees, our hickories, our, our high quality timber, because again, these trees adapted through time, those 3000 years of burning I was talking about, those are very thick bark species. They if they adapted through time to be able to live with fire and actually depend on fire as part of their, their life cycle. And so it's true, the butt end of some logs do take some damage, but from a system standpoint, so the more you burn, the more you reduce these other low value trees, which, you know, these low value trees are stealing nutrients and, and, and sunlight from your high value trees and they're giving them more space to to grow in the long run, burning is is beneficial to your to your timber um, resource. In the short run, yes, there is some damage. Um, it's it's very it's very much negligible in my mind. But in the long run, the health of your system will be such that these trees will, will grow larger and more healthy through time. All right, wonderful. 
Well, we greatly appreciate you being on. It looks like that's the only comments that we have, but um, I appreciate you joining us. And I really uh, think that we will probably definitely have you on again. So, <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Maybe we can give you a little more time where you can uh, go ahead and, and do longer on prescribed fire mm -hmm. if you need to. So greatly appreciate it. And thanks for joining us. No problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, well, this time we had a whole lot of different topics every you know and they were wonderful topics and we greatly appreciate you joining us um go to from the woods today.com if you have any questions at all you can shoot us an email that um, asks any questions about the show um all of our past issues are there as well so we can always you can always watch it's like oh what did Cody say about that fire or what was those pollinator tips? You can go to um, from the woods today.com and see that. So we greatly appreciate you joining us. And until next week, we will see you again at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye. From the woods today.